Father, look into your word and worship you. Pray as we have observed communion later today and as pastor brings the message that you'd bless that time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we'll be in John chapter 18 today. We'll get as far as we get and then we'll likely continue chapter 18 next week. There's no way we're doing the entire chapter today. But to back up a little bit as far as big picture context, as a reminder, we've been breaking the Gospel of John into four sections, a prologue, the book of signs, the book of glory, and then a last chapter, epilogue, chapter 21. And we're currently working through the book of glory that focuses on the farewell discourse, Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, chapters 13 through 20. And where we are in that so far is that can kind of be broken into two sections, chapter 13 to 17, which we wrapped up two weeks ago, is, farewells, is Jesus' farewell discourse and prayer with his inner circle of disciples, and then where we're starting now, chapters 18 to 20, focuses on Jesus' death and resurrection. And really, these, these events that are recorded from 13 to 20 pretty much cover three to four days' worth of events as the farewell discourse and prayer all occurred on the evening before Jesus was arrested, tried, and went to the cross. And this can be further broken down into that first section that we've already covered, 13 to 17. In chapter 13, there was an introduction that emphasized the love of Jesus for his disciples. And then chapters, thir the end of 13 through 16 was the farewell discourse. Uh, let's see, there we go. And the farewell discourse was broken into seven, several sections where Jesus in the farewell discourse was preparing his disciples for him leaving his earthly ministry and resuming his place above with the Father in his rightful place. And he was preparing them and transitioning the disciples with this farewell discourse for a time where they were no longer going to be the student who he was teaching and who he was protecting from the world, but rather they would be called to participate as witnesses of what he had taught. But that throughout this, he emphasized that he was not leaving the disciples in an abandonment, that he was going to be sending the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to continue the ministry that he had started with them through them and indwelling with them. And throughout this, some of the things that he was teaching, they did not fully understand at that time. And Jesus even acknowledged as he wrapped up the farewell discourse that at that time they were not going to completely understand, that they would not understand until his hour had been fulfilled, until after he had gone to the cross, he had been resurrected and ascended, and even more importantly, the Holy Spirit had come down and dwelling in them and reminding them of his words and helping to teach them the meaning and understanding of the words so that they could be a better witness. And then two weeks ago, we wrapped up Jesus' prayer that ended this farewell discourse. And in that prayer, there was a focus on, first and foremost, a prayer for the glory of the Father and the Son as Jesus was fulfilling the purpose he was sent for, and that was to die for a world in darkness. There was then a prayer for his present disciples to protect them from the evil one, to protect them from the hate of the world that would be turned against them as he was leaving the scene as far as physically on earth and him no longer being there to deflect and protect them. And we'll see in chapter 18, this comes into play where Jesus one last time protects the disciples from physical harm 
at his arrest, and where he deflects that one last time as he's physically still on earth, but is preparing to leave earth. And then there's a prayer for future disciples, for us, for future believers. And something of note that we looked at with that, there was very much an emphasis that those future believers were a result of the witness of the current believers that Jesus prayed for in the previous section, and Jesus was talking to and ministering to physically present at that time. And that, even though it's a short verse, is very remarkable in that it was an assurance that Jesus had confidence that those believers, despite the fact that with his arrest and his trial, they would be scattered, they would be scared, they would, in some cases, in the case of Peter, would deny Jesus completely. That despite that, that those individuals would be effective as witnesses in carrying on Jesus' ministry to the world is in darkness. And that is also going to be a theme that is going to come back in chapter 18, is that theme of Jesus' witnesses being called, Jesus' disciples being called as witnesses to participate in sharing the gospel. So where we're headed, verse, excuse me, verses, chapters 18 to 19 focuses on Jesus' betrayal, his arrest, his trial, crucifixion, and burial. And so in chapter 18, we have verses 1 to 12, the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. And then there's a series of trials with Jewish authorities and Roman authorities before the final verdict of crucify him is declared. And where Jesus is shuttled back and forth between the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities. And so in chapter 18, the focus is on Jesus' betrayal, arrest, and then his trial, both at the hands of the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities. And both are involved here as a picture that it is the entire world who is arrayed against Jesus. It wasn't the Jews who killed Jesus. It wasn't the Romans who killed Jesus. It was Jesus who was sent by the Father to die for our sins at the hand of the entire world who needed a savior. And then in chapter 19, in future works, we'll get into the actual crucifixion and death, excuse me, the crucifixion, death, and burial of Jesus. So that is the really quick seven, eight minute overview of where we've been and where we are to kind of give the bird's eye overview of context of where chapter 18 falls. So chapter 18 is falling after that farewell discourse, after prayer, and right before he goes to the cross. So let's get into the details of chapter 18, starting with the first section, verses 1 through 12, betrayal and arrest of Jesus. So in verse 1, we read, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. And then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. So the scene is set here in terms of the timeline when Jesus had spoken these words. So this is immediately after he had finished that final prayer after the farewell discourse. He and the disciples depart from the city proper of Jerusalem and had to cross the brook of Kidron to the east to a garden. 
So our map here of Jerusalem, uh, we have our, our temple in kind of the uh, northeastern quadrant of Jerusalem. Just to the east of that would be the Kidron Valley with the Kidron Brook. And then to the east of that would be the region of the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane. In the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is clear that the garden that is referenced in John is the Garden of Gethsemane, which was an olive grove. It likely was at least partially walled for protection, and it very likely was private property. That Jesus and his disciples knew the owner of this property and had permission to use this as a place of meeting, as a place of teaching, and a place of prayer. And so here, after that last supper, after the farewell discourse, Jesus goes there away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Now, further east of there would have been Bethany. And Bethany was where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived and had property and had a household. And this was a, a place, it was known that Jesus very commonly stayed at their house in Bethany when he was visiting Jerusalem and was in Jerusalem for one of the feasts or during his ministry. But in this occasion, he would not have gone all the way to Bethany. Because for an observing Jew at Passover time, an observing Jew was not supposed to leave the city limits of Jerusalem, or they become defiled and not able to participate in all of the Passover festivities. And the Garden of Gethsemane was considered the easternmost part of the city limits, where an individual could travel to there, but not be considered to have left the city limits of Jerusalem. So by going to the garden there, he was going to a place that was more secluded, more quiet than the city would be, even at night during the Passover festival time, but was still remaining within the Jerusalem city limits, so was not breaking the traditions, the religious Jewish traditions, that one was to stay within the city limits during Passover. Jesus would not have broken those customs. And so he is headed over there to this garden. It's a garden that we see here in verse 2. It says, Jesus often met there with his disciples. So even though that's not mentioned in other places, that's a detail that's revealed here that this was a common place that he would go to teach his disciples and to pray. In the other Gospels, it's recorded that once he got here, the disciples in here are kind of separated out into kind of groups where the bulk of the disciples are kind of left to watch at the entrance to the garden. And then he goes in with the inner disciples, Peter, John, and James. They are then to told and wait to pray and abide and watch, and then he goes on further to be by himself and prays. Those prayers are not recorded in the Gospel of John, not because it's contradicting the other Gospels, because that was just a facet that wasn't important to John and to the narrative that John is weaving here in this Gospel. Additionally, even though we know from the other Gospels that this is the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane is not specifically mentioned in the Gospel of John, and instead, it's referred to as a garden. The term garden is repeated more than once here in the introduction. And that is likely an intentional reference back to another garden. In the Gospel of John, it starts with John 1.1 1, 1 with the words, in the beginning, a very clear reference back to in the beginning in Genesis. And it starts with in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It goes on to explain that that was was created, was created through him. A reference back to Genesis. That Jesus was 
come to be flesh, to be fully man, but was also fully God, and as such was the creator of the universe, creator of the physical earth, the creator and separation of light and darkness. As the first day of creation in Genesis, the first act of creation was separating light and darkness. And then in John it goes on to then extend that, that Jesus is the spiritual light that brings life. So it's not only the creator of physical light, not only the separator of physical light and darkness, but it's the separator of spiritual light and darkness, and the darkness of the world and sin is a theme that shows up at the beginning there. In the beginning of Genesis, it shows up, and in the beginning of the Gospel of John, that shows up. And here we come back to that reference of Genesis with a reference to a garden. Adam and Eve placed in an initial garden of Eden, and the darkness in the world came because of their sin. So this is a reference back to that first garden where death and darkness and sin entered a world of life and light that was created by God but was spoiled by humankind sinning and breaking that. And so the first Adam, death came into the human race. And here we have now the second Adam in this garden about to bring life through his death. And so that, that seems to be a very intentional reference here of this garden, which is why here in John, it doesn't emphasize that this is Gethsemane or emphasize this is an olive garden because the image that is desired here is a thought back to that first garden where sin and death entered and God promised to Adam and Eve that a descendant of Eve would come who would crush the serpent's head and have his heel bruised. And that is exactly what is about to happen here. That descendant of Eve, that son of man, that son of God, has now entered this garden and is about to go to the cross to die that humankind could have spiritual life. And that image is reinforced in verse 2, where it has a statement, Jesus often met there with his disciples. His disciples, those who were his sheep, those who were the children of God that God the Father had given him, those who knew him and fellowshiped with him because they believed in him. Well, that's also a reference back to the Garden of Eden because initially in the Garden of Eden, it was where God himself would come and meet with Adam and Eve and fellowship with them in that garden. So here we have further this picture that this is where the one who was with God and was God, the Son of God, had descended, taken on flesh so that he could meet with humankind again and have fellowship in this garden, just like the initial intention of creation was. But here, there's a little different emphasis, and that now he's here to die, to bring life. It's also noticeable, notable that Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, was also considered a garden, and that where Jesus was buried before he raised was a garden. So there's this emphasis on this hour coming back to the garden where it all began. Not that Gethsemane was, you know, in any way the Garden of Eden or something like that, but the same picture of its coming back to where God had, is fulfilling that promise he had made that he had not forgotten. There's also another imagery here and that they've gone out from likely the lower city, not far from the original city of David, where they would have been in the upper room for that final supper, and had traversed across the Kidron Valley, eastward out of Jerusalem. In 2 Samuel 15, there's a record of another individual who took that same route 
from Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley, across into the Mount of Olives. And that would have been King David when his son Absalom had wrestled the throne and turned Jerusalem against David. And where at that time, Jerusalem was rejecting David as their king, and he's fled from Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley. In 2 Samuel 15, 23, we have, And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people crossed over. The king himself also crossed over the Kidron, and all the people crossed over toward the way of the wilderness. And so we have this image going back to the Old Testament in this account of David, the king of the Jews, David, the king of Israel, being rejected and driven out. And here in chapter 18, the image of Jesus being the king of the Jews, rejected by the Jewish authorities, comes through very strongly. And so the Messiah being the promised one who is in the line of David, that individual who's always looked to in Israel's history as that preeminent king who is is the picture for the Messiah of the coming one who would be in the line of the kingship of David. We have that same picture here tying moving across the Kidron Valley, of both the king of King David was rejected, and here we're going to see in chapter 18, Jesus is also rejected by the Jewish authorities. There we go. So we have setting the stage here the significance of the location of the garden. And if that wasn't enough, there's another significance of this location. So this would be the Mount of Olives where it borders the temple area. In that Mount of Olives region was where the sheep were kept who were used as the sacrifices in the temple. And that would be especially important as here this is occurring to the time of Passover where there's an image of God protecting his people and saving his people out of Egypt at Passover, where they sacrificed that lamb and painted the blood on their doorposts so the angel of death would pass over and not kill their firstborn. And here in Passover, this is what they're celebrating. And they would have been taking lambs who were raised in the Mount of Olives area, who had no blemish, and would have been sacrificing them in the temple and then eating them as part of the Passover meal as this symbol looking forward to God's fulfillment of that promise in the first garden that he would send one who would save and redeem not only Israel but the entire world out of darkness for those who believe. And this is an echo back to John the Baptist's proclamation of Jesus back in the beginning of the Gospel of John, where John the Baptist sees Jesus and proclaims, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus has just done this farewell discourse in this prayer asking for the glorification of the Son and the Father, sanctifying himself, preparing himself to be the perfect Lamb of God, who now is in the location where those lambs would have traditionally been raised, waiting to be arrested and taken to be that sacrifice. And so in these first few verses, the setting of the disciples and going to the, the, across the brook of Kidron to the garden is very significant and very important. It's also likely why in the Gospel of John, John does not record the prayer 
in Gethsemane that is recorded in the other Gospels. Because that would have detracted from the focus here, that the focus of Gospel of John being Jesus coming as the Lamb of God. Whereas the other Gospels had a little bit different focus as far as Mark being a focus on Jesus come as a suffering servant. And Matthew as Jesus coming as a fulfillment of the Davidic promise of the Messianic king. And Luke being Jesus coming as a savior for humanity, being the son of man. Each one has a little bit different focus on this, this hour because of that. The other thing that's significant about this is we see in chapter 2, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. So John, out of all the Gospels, very much emphasizes and announces Judas as being the one who betrayed Jesus. John wants to make this very clear and tie this in, that it's not some other Judas. It's Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. And part of Judas' role in taking the bribe from the chief priest, those 30 pieces of silver in the betrayal, was to help the chief priest locate where Jesus was. And here it's interesting because this is really God's will. And this was God's will from the beginning of time that Jesus would come and die. Jesus doesn't go and hide at this point. Previous in the Gospel of John, we saw that when they sought to kill him, he hid himself and departed. Here he's gone apart, kind of like he did in Galilee, to separate himself from the crowd and hide himself. But in this case, it's very clear he is not hiding himself. He is going to a place that John the evangelist here makes it very clear, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. Jesus went to a place that he knew Judas would know to look. Judas really wasn't necessary for this betrayal at all because it's what Jesus came to do. It's interesting that we talked about back at the Last Supper that towards the end of it, where Judas is handed the piece of bread to signify he is the one who's going to betray, Jesus commands him to leave and tells him, go immediately and do what you are going to do. And at that moment, it becomes clear, it should become clear to the reader that what Judas was doing his betrayal was neither a surprise nor a problem to Jesus. In fact, in some ways, Jesus was accelerating the timeline. It becomes clear throughout this t- trial here that the, the Jewish authorities who are plotting to do this are in a complete disarray with their trial. They aren't ready for this. And part of it is because Jesus forced their hand by handing that sop of bread to Judas and saying, go do what you're doing. And he went to the priest and says, we got to put this plan in action right now because Jesus knows the plan and we can't give them a chance to counter this plan not understanding that not only did Jesus know the plan, he was sent to be part of the plan, and Judas here in betraying Jesus is in service of God in some ways. And so, of course, Jesus didn't need to go hide. And Judas didn't really need to do this act of betrayal. This is a decision he made that he had to live with the consequences of. The consequences of rejecting the Redeemer. We then also have in verse 3, Judas having received a detachment of troops. This would have been a Roman detachment, a Roman cohort that would have been commissioned very likely through Pontius Pilate. So Pontius Pilate would have been the Roman governor of Judea at that time. He normally took up residence in Caesarea. But at the Passover time, because so many Jews, especially Jewish men, would have been converging on Jerusalem, and because the Romans were aware of the symbolism of Passover to the Jewish people, it was when the Jewish people were celebrating 
them being freed from Egypt, there was always concern that this could be a catalyst for a Jewish rebellion against Rome. And so because of that, Pilate would take Roman soldiers and he would relocate his headquarters temporarily from Caesarea to Jerusalem to be a presence there. Along with that, Herod Antipas, who was the Roman governor in Galilee, he also would take a garrison of Roman troops and move from his headquarters in Galilee to temporarily take up residence in Jerusalem, which is why in the other Gospels we see the Roman trial is this bouncing Jesus back and forth between Pilate and Herod because they were both Roman officials who were in Jerusalem to reduce the risk of a rebellion or uprising. And so the other role that Judas had was to be a witness and evidence that the Jewish authorities could take to either Pilate or Herod, more likely Pilate since he was the governor of Judea, and say, there is this individual, this rebel rouser, this individual who's setting himself up to be the king of the Jews, who's a troublemaker, who maybe is going to have rebellion, could you write us an order so that we could have some Roman troops to go and apprehend him to keep the peace? And so likely the fact that Judas is guiding a detachment of Roman soldiers, these are from Pilate, and Pilate would have only commissioned them if he had had enough evidence to think that the accusations against Jesus were true. Because the Romans, as brutal as they were, were a culture of laws. They were a culture that had procedures and laws that had to be followed. And so because of that, the fact that these Roman soldiers were here, they were commissioned by Pilate, handed over to use. Now, the cohort here, the Greek word that's used, there's some question as far as how many people that could have been. A full cohort would have been both foot soldiers and cavalry and could have numbered as many as 1,000 people. It's unlikely in this context that it was 1,000. A standard cohort was 600 foot soldiers, a maniple, which was a smaller cohort that is likely more the case in this context, was 200 Roman soldiers. Now, regardless of the exact numbers, these were Roman soldiers. These were elite trained soldiers. They were not the park police. They were not public safety. They were the strongest power and authority you could wield at that time in the world. And there was a fairly large number of them. We don't know the exact number of them, but there was a fairly large number of them who were being guided by Judas. From the other Gospels and from what's written here, we also have officers from the chief priest. Officers from the chief priest would have been the Jewish temple police. So the Jews, even though they were under Rome's thumb, were allowed to have their own local authorities, which would have been the, the Sanhedrin, which would have been the ruling body that would have consisted of the chief priest, who would have been primarily Sadducees. They would have consisted of some elite ruling Pharisees, individuals like Nicodemus, and then the scribes. And there would have been 71 of them. And they would have acted as the local Jewish rulership and their ruling seat centered around the temple. And along with that, they had their own enforcement group, the temple police, who've already shown up some in the Gospel of John. And these temple police had very much authority within the temple itself because once you move from the court of Gentiles into the temple proper itself, Gentiles weren't allowed to, to go in there. So because of that, Roman authorities didn't set foot in there. And so you had the temple police who had authority there and had authority to some extent outside in Jerusalem. And here they are represented. So we have Roman authorities, we have Jewish authorities. Also, there are servants from the high priest there. 
And there's also a group of other people who are mentioned as being armed. And then we have Judas. And so the picture here of this whole group of people is the entire world from the Jewish mindset is represented. We have the Jewish authorities, we have the Roman authorities, we have the, the representations of the temple, some of the priests, and some of the servants of the high priest. And then we also have a third authority here. Yeah, let's see. We have a third authority, and Judas is specifically mentioned several times, that Judas is with them. Judas is with them. And Judas is a sand in here, not just for himself and his evil actions, but back in chapter 13, verse 2, we had in a supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And in verse 27, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him, that would be Judas, and Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Here in the Gospel of John, we have the imagery of Judas also representing the authority of of Satan, the authority of spiritual darkness. So what we have here is a raid against Jesus, the world's authorities, Jewish and Roman, Jewish and Gentile, and to the Jewish culture, that's all there is, just Jewish and Gentile. And then we have a raid, the spiritual darkness arrayed against him also. And they're coming at night because they're carrying lanterns and they are also carrying torches. They're coming at night. We talked about before in the Gospel of John, night is never referred to in a positive way in the Gospel of John. It is always both a physical reality, the events occurred at night, but it's also when that's mentioned is an emphasis on the darkness of the world in sin. And there's several things with this. They're coming with lanterns and torches, humankind's feeble attempts to illuminate the darkness. And ironically, they're coming to arrest the light of the world, the creator of physical light and the light of the world with their feeble torches and their feeble lanterns and their feeble weapons that despite the fact that they represent the full power of Jerusalem, of Rome, and of Satan, it is still a feeble attempt. And Jesus is not hiding. Not only that, despite the fact that Jesus, Judas has been guiding them along here to point out which individual in this dark garden is, is Jesus. It turns out he doesn't need to do that because in the next section, verses 4 to 9, we have Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says to them, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. So here we have, despite the show of force, all of these authorities arrayed, when they get to this garden in the dark with their torches and their weapons and their authority from Rome and their authority from, from Jerusalem and their authority of the world's darkness as far as Satan with Judas, who speaks first? It's the one who John is emphasizing throughout all of this is the one who is in complete control of this complete situation, the one who is being arrested, Jesus himself. He doesn't run and hide. 
He doesn't wait for them to ask him. He doesn't wait for Judas to, to, to declare him by kissing him. Instead, he steps forward and greets them with authority. Whom do you speak? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And his response is, Jesus said to them, I am he. Now in the Greek, there's ego eme. And we've seen that before. And that can be translated two different ways. It can be translated as an informal, just it is I. I'm the guy. I'm the person you're looking for type of thing in a casual, informal way. But it also can be used, as it was used back in John chapter 8, to refer to the great I am, reference back to where the great I am, God Jehovah, met Abraham at the burning bush. Where Jesus said to the Jewish authorities at that time, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And here there, there's different thoughts from commentators as whether this was intended to be just the it is I, or whether it's to be the I am. And different ones take different thoughts on this. Um, from verse 6, the fact that when he said this, they drew back and fell to the ground, it's likely the I am. That those temple police recognized he was making the same proclamation he had made to them with this statement in John chapter 8. Now, there are others who say, well, it was a dark mountainside, and they were shocked and surprised that the person they were arresting stepped forward and, and announced himself and identified himself. And so they took a, a step back in a defensive process. And because it was dark and they were on a hillside, they stumbled and fell. Maybe. But some of these people are Roman soldiers. These are not individuals who, in dark, rough terrain, are known for having poor footing. Uh, these, unless they were like dispatched, the worst Roman soldiers ever. These were the best of the best. They were not going to be afraid of somebody stepping forward saying, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, I am, unless there was something more to it. And not only that, they drew back and fell to the ground. This is an imagery of fear. A fear at an awesome God and a little bit of reverence. Not a reverence here out of respect, but a reverence out of fear and terror. Not a defensive posture. And not only that, they're not stepping back to arm the cell to arrest him. Jesus has to put them back on track. Because after they step back and fall to the ground... In chapter, in verse 7, we have, then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? To again emphasize he's the one in authority here. And secondly, they are in such a disarray at this statement, in such fear, they've fallen to the ground, they've lost the plot, they've forgotten why they've come here. And because it is God's will that Jesus go to the cross, Jesus himself has to put the arresting parties and the betrayers back on the track of arresting him. Whom are you seeking? And they regroup themselves, and they come back with the same answer, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answers, I have told you that I am here. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. It's kind of throughout John, there's lots of double meanings. I think this, if you seek me, is, is a double meaning here. One, he's saying, okay, since I'm the person you're coming to arrest me, arrest me and let these other people go because they're not your concern because you're here to arrest me and only me. But on the other hand, there's also the double meaning of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life that those who seek him might believe and have eternal life. Hiding in here, Jesus is sharing the gospel with them. He's encouraging them that they should seek him for life. They should seek him, the representative of the great I am.
And this all occurs under darkness. Back in the beginning of John, we had, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And the Greek word there that's translated comprehend has a double meaning. It can be translated either comprehend or overcome, and both meanings were attended in that verse. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, and the darkness did not overcome it. And we see that exactly occurring right here. The world in darkness, Satan in darkness, is arrayed in all of their power and authority against Jesus. And not only do they not understand completely who he is, they do not overcome him. And even in their plot to arrest and kill him, Jesus has to assist them in arresting him so that he can die for them. Because they're that inept. In verse 9, we then have that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. And it might be easy with everything going on to pass over that, where it says the saying might be fulfilled which he, spoke, which he spoke. Throughout the Gospels, and especially John, anytime we have the phrase, it might be fulfilled, is almost always a reference, a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. But here it's applied to Jesus' words might be fulfilled, which he spoke. And what John is suddenly doing here is putting Jesus' words equal to the words of Scripture, and rightfully so. And for those of us looking back on this, this should be fairly obvious. He was the Word. He is God. But on the other hand, to the Jewish audience at that time, here was the Scripture. And John is saying, Here's Jesus' words right at the same spot. They're fulfilled the same way. Authenticating him. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. There's a double meaning here also. Here he's intervening by saying, let these go their way. So the wrath of the world won't fall on them at this time and arresting and killing them. But additionally, he's about to go to the cross to die for them so that they can have spiritual life, so that he will lose none of them. None of his children, none of his sheep will be lost. Let's skip over that. We then have Simon Peter stepping up. He hasn't quite caught on to the plot here, unfortunately. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? So Peter's making good on a promise he had made to Jesus back in chapter 13. Why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And those were not idle words for Peter. He meant it. He brought a sword. Now, likely, it wasn't a full-fledged, double-bladed sword. It was a long knife, single-bladed single for hacking and slicing, where a double-bladed sword for, was for piercing. So a double-bladed sword was designed so that when you stab somebody with it, that double-blade action, as the person fought and struggled against it, would work deeper into the muscle fiber. That's why the Bible is referred to as a double-edged sword, because once it's applied, it just works deeper and deeper and deeper, and you cannot escape it. Whereas the single-edged sword was for hacking and slashing, and that's what Peter does here. Now, there's some discussion here among the commentators as far as whether uh, this was just ineptness and bad aim that Jesus cut the guy's ear off rather than slicing his throat, or whether it was intentional. Some think Peter was showing his exuberance, but the fact he was a fisherman, not a soldier, and that he went to slice the, the servant's throat and instead got his ear. And he just wasn't very good aim. Others point out that in Josephus' writings, the Jewish historian Josephus, he writes an account about a high priest who was disqualified from office due to a mutilated ear. And it could be that Peter was aware of that, and this individual, being the servant of the high priest, by cutting his ear off, he was bringing shame to the high priest 
because in that culture, how you treated the servant indicated how you treated the master of the servant. And so here, this may have been deliberate act of defiance on the part of Peter to cut that ear off to show that the individual who servant that was wasn't qualified to be the high priest and intentionally disfigured him. Now, Peter also is, is stepping into a hornet's nest here in that there's Roman soldiers there. There's temple guards. He's just drawn a weapon. Jesus had just asked that he be set free and not arrested, and Peter is, is like, no, I'm in for it. Um, they're going to have to take me down swinging. They're going to have to kill me swinging because he had promised to do this. But Jesus rebuked him at that promise and said, no, you're not dying for me because Jesus needed to die for him so that Peter could follow him. Peter's almost ensuring his death, but he doesn't die, and he doesn't get arrested, only because, again, it's interesting. You'd think, with all the, the soldiers there, that the one who would wrestle him to the ground would have been one of the Roman soldiers or one of the Jewish temple police. But nope, again, it's the one who has real authority here. Jesus tells him, put your sword away, Peter. You're about to get yourself killed, and it's not your turn to get killed right now. Secondly, it's not recorded here, but it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke, he heals Malchus's ear. So now there's no reason to arrest or wrestle Peter to the floor because the person he just injured is, in fact, not injured anymore. All of the evidence is gone. It didn't happen. So Jesus is stepping in and protecting Peter from Peter's rash act before going to the cross and stepping in and protecting all of us from our rash acts by giving us a way out through salvation. And Jesus mentioned, shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? Notice he doesn't say, shall I not be arrested by the world here? He refers to his Father here. In the Old Testament, the cup is always a reference to God's judgmental wrath against sin. Jesus is saying he is going because he is going to drink that cup of wrath that is meant for humanity. He's not being arrested here. He's giving himself to do his Father's will. He is the one in authority. And then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. They bound him like a sacrifice would be bound. And they take him back to Jerusalem, to the priest for trial. I find it also interesting here that even after all of this, they found it necessary to bind him. He hasn't, arrest, arrest, he hasn't resisted arrest. He identified himself. He's not fighting. When his disciple fights, he breaks up that fight and heals the guy who's injured. And yet, the Romans and the Jews still are like, we've got to tie this guy up. He is not a tame lion. And I'm way over time. Sorry about about that. Um, but uh, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words and thank you for sending your son to die for us. And pray that we remember this as we take communion. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And we continue chapter 8.